turn to uh, Peter. I think you be really encouraging verse, man. It says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you, that he might sift you like wheat, but I pray that your faith may not fail you. Super encouraging, isn't it? Mm. You ever heard that verse and, and you're a Christian, you might be like, this Christian thing is not for me. <laughs> it says in James, submit yourselves to God, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Resist the devil. What does that practically look like? When we have a real enemy trying to steal our joy, steal our hope, destroy our commitment, what do we do? The title of today's message is called How to Stand Fair in the Face. How to stand firm in the face of accusation. And my hope is that you'll gain an understanding into how our spiritual battle operates today. And you are equipped to stand firm. That you are equipped to stand firm and resist the, the devil. We're in, a, we're in a new sermon series called The Almighty in All of Us. And what we're doing is we're going through our values as a church. Like Josh said, we, we launched a few weeks ago and we want to go through how we're partnering with God for his glory and to further his kingdom. Amen. One of our main values is that we are truth-seeking, spirit-led, faith-filled warriors of God. And we said the last few weeks, uh, if you hear that, you might be like, man, I'm just trying to get God to bless my food and get to Sunday. That is it, right? <laughs> you know, and it's not, about, it's not about doing anything that you're not doing now. Week one, um, I'll, I'll let you know what we're doing over here. This is our illustration. Week one, we said we're truth-seeking and we're spirit-led, and the reason that we are that is because we find ourselves in these strongholds. This is a really bad jail cell because it doesn't actually have a back door, and you can just get out, which is really ironic, but that's usually the truth when you're in a stronghold anyway. Amen, right? We said we're truth-seeking because the truth leads to life, not because we're religious or because we're goody two-shoes or because we want the world to look at us and go, look at those amazing Christians, they're amazing. No, because the truth leads to life, Amen. We said that we're spirit-led because the spirit will lead us out of the stronghold. Amen. The truth leads to life. We have to follow the Holy Spirit to lead us out of the stronghold. And once we're out of the stronghold, out from where we have always been in our life, we are faith-filled because we need faith to actually take a step into a place where we have never been before. Amen. Amen. Because if you are calling Christ your Lord and Saviour, He's going to take you places where you've never been. Been. Amen. And you need faith to go there. Faith in who God is. We said faith was understanding who God was, who God is, and understanding that He is the truth. Amen. And that God has integrity. And so you can trust the character of God. Amen. And so today we're just tying this up with the last part, warrior of God. And it might be a little bit different to what you've heard before. And I want to talk about spiritual warfare today a little bit. And how to stand firm in that. When you're out taking a step of faith, you are going to get attacked. Welcome to church where we encourage everyone. Um, you know, <laughs> if you're not having doubts in your Christian walk, if you're not having lies fed to you, if you're not having attacks on you, then you're probably not doing this Christian thing right. Or maybe you just haven't recognised that it's actually the enemy. Either way, I think we should address it today, shall we? Shall we address it today? I'm going to pray. Father God, we, uh, we want your Holy Spirit today to lead this message. We want, we want to hear your heart today, Father God. It is a privilege to be here and to be your mouthpiece. But, Father God, I don't want any of me in this, Father God. But we want all of you, Lord. We, we want all of you, Father God. We just bind the enemy in Jesus' name, Father God. We bind doubts in Jesus' name and lies in Jesus' name, Father God. And we ask for your freedom in this place this morning, Lord, that there will be power in your word this morning. That, Father God, something today will change and shift Lord, for anyone that is in a stronghold today, because we know, Lord, that your name is life. Amen. Your name is freedom, Lord. And so, Father God, today, we ask for your power today on the lies, Lord, of the enemy. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 We're going to get a little bit heavy uh, this morning, and I'm going to throw a lot of scripture at you. Is that okay? I feel like we can handle it as a church. Is that all right? If we read the Bible in church, is that good? Okay, all right, here we go. So you're going to have to stick with me, right? Uh, it's going to get heavy. You're going to be like, what is he talking about? Some of this sounds really weird. I haven't even read that part of the Bible. I didn't know it was in there. 
but we're just going to go there. We're going to get into some prophecy. We're going to get into some, don't worry, we're not weirdos if you're new here. And we're going we're gonna to take back what the enemy has stolen. Amen? Amen? Because you have freedom in Jesus. And there is freedom in this word today. In this word today. So first thing, we have to understand the spiritual environment that we find ourselves in. Ephesians 5. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them, for it is shameful even to speak of the things that do in secret. But when, everything, when anything is exposed to light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, and here's our word this morning, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. In this moment, this is our word from God, awake, awake, O sleeper. I remember when I was, um, yeah, okay, that's just, that's just, that's my flesh saying, don't tell them, but it's fine, and if you, it's fine, it's fine, um, I'll tell you. One time I was working, back when, I had to go through the baptism of fire, you know, when you first go, start working, and you have to go work at McDonald's, and I worked at McDonald's, and was, honestly, people give McDonald's crap, but that is like, you know, you learn a lot of valuable lessons there. Anyway, one of the valuable lessons I did learn is that um, they don't care too much um, about how much you work, as long as you turn up and you're a cheap labour. If you work there, they do love you, it's okay. Um, I know someone that works there this year, so it's great, it is great. Um, I worked a 21-hour shift one time, um, which is illegal, right, but I just said yes, and I wanted the money, and I just kept working, and finished at midnight, and I was living out... Um, past the bypass, past Bass Highway at the time, and I drove home, and um, I was so tired. I don't know if anyone's ever done a 21 hour shift, but I am not built for it. It is not for me, and I was so tired, and I was like, I never even fathomed that you could fall asleep driving. I was 17, and I was like, that just can't happen because you're so alert because of the danger of actually falling asleep while you're driving could kill you, right? So I'm like, surely... The adrenaline of the fear of death should keep you awake. And I was just on the nod, you know, like this, like this. And it was only like six minutes home, I'm doing 90 k's an hour down the bypass and I fall asleep and I wake up on the gravel, right, and I just freak out and I just turn the wheel because I have no idea and I turn the wheel and the car starts spinning and I'm like, see you all in heaven. I thought that was it. I spun like 72 times or what felt like 72 times and then I hit a tree. By the time I hit the tree, I was only doing like 30 k's an hour because I'm a drift expert and I just, you know what I mean? I was like, now it is time to stop and I drifted into the tree and I was like, oh, 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 oh and I, I was like, how many broken bones do I have? You know what I mean? And I didn't, I didn't even have a scratch. I was quite disappointed. And the reason I was disappointed is because the damage to the car wasn't that bad, but it was still very expensive, and it wasn't my car. And so I went home to the person whose car it was that I was boarding with at the time. I say boarding, but we're living in a caravan together as two bachelors. Um, and I parked the car, and two thoughts went through my mind. Do I wake him up and tell him, or do I just wait and know that I'm not going to need an alarm clock in the morning? You know what I mean? And in the morning, sure enough, at 6am, I did not need an alarm clock. As my friend was very angry, as it was maybe the third or fourth time I had crashed his car. <laughs> and all I heard was, are you serious? Are you serious? And when we're asleep, especially at the wheel, amen, it is very dangerous. And our word today is awake, awake. When Christ saves you, he wants you to be awake. He, he didn't save you to come to a church, he saved you to be awake. But come to church, it's great, right? And there is a way that you can be alive and awake in a crumbling world. 
we live in a disappointing and fallen world. Amen? Like, that's not something everyone's like, yay! But the, the, the good news is, is that Christ saved you to be alive and awake and free in a disappointing and crumbling world. Ephesians 6, 11, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Schemes. Darkness has a plan for you. And um, that's not very encouraging, but I want you to be aware and awake that darkness has a plan for you and we have to understand the spiritual climate that we are in if we are going to stand firm in it. Amen? If we're going to stand firm in something, we have to understand the spiritual climate in which we are standing firm in, in which we are resisting the devil from. Amen. And there's two questions I want to answer today. Why should I stand firm? What happens when we don't? And how do I do it? How do I do it, Matt? Why and how? Because I feel like so many times, I don't know if it's just you, but you face a problem and someone comes to you and says, just stand firm, just stand firm, just stand firm. And you're like, I don't even know what that means, to stand firm. And it feels like all you're trying to tell me is to toughen up. Amen? Amen? You have Christ in you. You should just toughen up. You have the glory of God in you. Why are you facing issues? You are facing issues because you have the glory of God in you. Amen. And today, we are going to take back what the enemy stole off us. I am. Oh, all right. Here we go. We often find ourselves in a battle. Battle. We often find ourselves in a battle room. But I want to talk to you about a court room, right? And you're going to have to stick with me here a little bit. Because I'm going to go throw a bunch of scripture. And then it's all going to make sense at the end. And you're going to be free from the stronghold. And you're going to be like, hallelujah. Yahweh is awesome. God is awesome. I'm really confused. All right. Daniel 7. As I looked, Daniel 7, all right, it's going to sound awesome. As I looked, thrones were placed and the Ancient of Days took his seat. That's God. His clothing was white as snow and the hair of his head was like pure wool. Oh, Lord of Lord, King of Kings. Whew. His throne was fiery flames. Its wheels were burning fire. A stream of fire issued and came out before him. A thousand thousand served him and ten thousand ten times ten thousand stood before him. The court sat in judgment and the books were opened. And they're, they're, two, they're the two phrases we're going to unpack today, is that the courts sat in judgment and the books were opened. So God is sitting there on his throne in the throne room, right? And he is both the judge and the ruler. Amen? He is both the judge and the ruler. And we have to understand the rule of God and how it operates in his court. Amen? He is both the judge and the ruler. He, it is his courtroom. You ever heard the judge say that? This is my courtroom. Amen? Daniel 7.25, he shall speak words. We're talking about the Antichrist now. The Antichrist. He is the Antichrist. He shall speak words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints. That's you. You are the saints of the Most High. But the court shall sit in judgment, and his dominion shall be taken away to be consumed and destroyed to the end. So this is a future prophecy of the Antichrist being in the courtroom of God and God taking away the dominion, the rule of the Antichrist. Are we still with me? Are you still with me? Right? So the Antichrist will be brought to court and what does the Antichrist do? He seeks to wear out the saints. Have you ever felt like that? You're in your Christian walk and you're trying to do stuff and the enemy is just trying to grind you down and grind you down and grind you. And you might not even think it's just the enemy. You're just sitting there saying, I'm so exhausted from all of this. I'm so exhausted. And, and obviously this is a prophecy for the end times. This is about the future but if we turn to 1 John 2.18, it says, Children, it is the last hour. Now, I don't know when the last hour is. No one knows. No one knows when, when the last hour is. It says it in the Bible that no one knows. But when Christ, died, when Christ rose again, we are in a period of grace here. And, this, and God operates outside time. Amen. And so ever since Christ rose again until the end is the last hour. We do not know. Right? Children, this is the last hour. And as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, 
so now many antichrists have come. Therefore, we know it is the last hour. And so what Daniel is talking about that will happen in the future is already happening in the world now, right? There are, what is an antichrist? An antichrist is a spirit of hatred toward Jesus. An antichrist is a spirit of hatred toward Jesus. And John tells us that many antichrists have come. And what do the antichrists do? They wear out the saints. Wear out. And most of you are sitting there going, hang on, hang on. This is starting to make sense practically because I feel a little bit worn out. And so the antichrists are operating now and trying to knock you off your path. Off your path. They're trying to knock you off the will of God for you. They're trying to steal what God has purposed for your life. Right? You have got a purpose that you were born for, that you were created for, that you are trying to walk out, hopefully to give God glory. Right? And we've got a spiritual enemy with Antichrist, which are, you know, spiritual demons trying to knock you off your path. Right? We have a spiritual enemy, and the spiritual enemy is trying to break up your marriage, trying to break up your church, trying to break up your commitment, trying to steal your joy, trying to steal your hope, trying to put some cloud of a stronghold over your life so you can't complete what God has for you in his will. Welcome to church, where we give you encouraging messages, right? So there is a spirit moving against Christ in the world, right? And it's going to culminate in the Antichrist. In the end, it's going to culminate in the Antichrist. I'm not even going to get into that. I'll do an end time sermon sometime. I did it last year. I'll do it again. Right? It will culminate in the ultimate Antichrists, right? But there are Antichrists operating right now, and a discerning, awake person can notice what is happening. And that is why Paul calls for us as Christians to be awake to this. Because the enemy wants us to be asleep to it. Because the enemy knows that we hold the victory. Amen. And if we wake up that we hold the victory, the enemy doesn't stand a chance. Amen. Amen. So the court sat in judgment and the books were open. There's two phrases. The court sat in judgment and the books were open. 1 Peter 5 eight. Be sober-minded, be watchful, your adversary... Adverse, adversary, yeah, adversary, yeah, good. Josh is my pronunciation. He just gives me a nod if I get it right. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion and seeking someone to devour. Isn't this interesting that Peter uses the word adversary and in the Greek, the word is anti-diakos. It is a legal term for accuser. So it is a legal term. Like God's rule, God's kingdom, God's spiritual realm operates legally. You, if you call on Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, right, you have a covenant with Jesus. A covenant is a legal term, is a relationship with Jesus. You get what he has, he got what you had, he got your sin, he died for it, you become co-heirs with Christ. Amen? You have a covenant, you have a bond that can't be broken. Adversary is a legal term. Revelation 12, it says that our accuser accuses us day and night. Day and night. And where is he accusing us? In court. In court. Stay with me. It's all going to make sense. Everyone's like, what? Satan robs you by taking you to court. And the grounds that he can take you to court is because he has something to accuse you of. He has something to accuse you of. So Satan gets into court. Right, and he says, Your Honor, because Satan still has to submit to God. Some people believe that God, Satan doesn't, he, he just goes around and God doesn't care and God can't do anything. Satan still submits to God, right? God is the great I am. And Satan, Satan says, Your Honor, you can't fulfill your purpose, you can't fulfill your will, right, in this person's life. You can't. What you want to do in this world, what you want, you cannot fulfill in this person's life or in their church, or in their community, or in their family, and the accuser will tell the judge and accuse you. And we, if you've ever felt accusation on you, it is from the enemy. This person is a 
liar. This person is an adulterer. Do you remember, God, what they did before they knew you? There's no way that someone that came from that past can be used for your glory. And we start to forget what Jesus has done for us on the cross and who we are in Christ. Because the devil wears down the saints. Satan will use your past, your present, and your future sin to try and accuse you and tie it to your worth. You're not a child of God anymore. You're a liar. That's who you are. You just can't stop lying, which means you are, that is your, your identity. Josh spoke about in communion about our worth. What is our worth? And is it tied to the, to the worth of Jesus Christ? Because what Satan will do is get your sin and paint it on you. And when you look in the mirror, you no longer see child of God. You see the sin. I was an adulterer. I'll always be an adulterer. Once a cheater, always a cheater, even though I've repented from it. And I I get it that Jesus died for me, but I, I, I cheated and that's who I am. That's who I always will be. And it's just not true. It's just not true. Someone needs to hear that it's just not true. If you have repented from the sin, you must repent, amen, and turn the other way. If you have repented from that sin and turn the other way, you are a child of God. That is your identity. Child of, son of God. God, daughter of God, my gosh. If you read about how God speaks about his daughters in the Bible, like I say it all the time, men, you have been trusted with something so precious to God. So precious. You are so precious in the eyes of the Lord. If, 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 if you call on Jesus Christ as your Lord and Saviour, you are so precious. So, so precious. We must not let Satan tie our sin to our identity. So how do we beat it, right? Daniel says the books were opened. The court sat in judgment. Are we still with me? The court sat in judgment. Books were opened. I want to talk to you about your book. I want to talk to you about your book. Psalm 139, David, your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me. Your book of life that you read about in Revelation, that you read about in Daniel, has your purpose in there. It has God's will for your life written in there. You're like, but I haven't written the chapter yet. How can he write it? (laughs) What Satan wants to do is stop what is in your book coming to fruition. He wants to stop what is in your book coming to fruition. Don't believe me? What did he do with Jesus Satan tried to stop the will of God when Jesus was here on earth, didn't he? He tried to stop that when Jesus was born, he tried to crush him straight away, didn't he? He tried to kill Jesus straight away. He then tried to tempt Jesus in the wilderness, didn't he? He tempted Jesus and then he couldn't tempt Jesus. So what did he try to do? If Satan can't crush you, he tries to raise Jesus up and say, okay, Jesus, you have all the kingdoms then. Have everything. I'll elevate you to be the ruler of this world, right? And then everyone tried to push Jesus to be the king that they wanted, not the king that he was sent to become. And Satan still uses these tactics today. He will try and crush you or elevate you in the world. He will try and crush you or elevate you so the world can crush you. Because status and power in this world doesn't end well for us as Christ followers, does it? Crush you or raise you and then 
finally Jesus gets to the Garden of Gethsemane and at the point of his humanity, of his struggle, of his pain, he asked God to take away the cup. He says, God, take the suffering away. I don't want to do it. I don't want to go to the cross. Do you remember he prayed that prayer in his humanity? He said, Lord, take the cross away from me. And God said, no. 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 Three times. And Jesus turned around and said, okay, your will be done. Your will be done. And I want to let you know that in your story, there is a bigger story. And that bigger story is the will of God for the glory of God. Whatever you are going through in your story, and if you are being obedient to God and walking that, there is a bigger story. And it's called the glory of God. And it's His will. You know, if I was sitting there taking notes, I said it before, if I was sitting there taking notes in the Garden of Gethsemane, and I'm like, man, this guy is a son of God. Like, he is, he is, he is, he is, he is part of the Trinity. Like, and he's praying to his Father to take away the suffering. And his dad said, no. Like, I don't know if you've ever had a child suffer. And, 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 and you look down at them. Like, I, I remember my son needed stitches in his eye, just above his eye. And, and the doctor said, hold his head. And, and Emma's like, I can't do that. And I'm like, man, I hate it when I have to man up. And so Emma went and sat in the car and I had to hold his head. while And, and he was sleeping, man. And was, he was like, one? And, and, and they're like, we have to wake him up in case he jerks his head. I'm like, you are evil people. You know, may, may the Sodom and Gomorrah wrath come. No, I'm kidding. And I had to hold his head while, while he sat there and gave him two stitches and he's screaming. And it's like, man, if I had the power to take his suffering away, I'll do it like that. And Jesus is sitting there saying, Dad, take the suffering away. And then he says, your will be done. And then he gets arrested. Like, man, if I'm sitting there taking notes, I'm like, this prayer stuff sucks. <laughs> it didn't work. But inside that story was the bigger story of our redemption. And that bigger story of our redemption was the will of God that Jesus said, not my will, but your will be done. And so you have this book of life with the purpose that God has for your life to bring him glory and Satan is trying to take that away from you. Satan is trying to steal that away from you. So how does this play out? How does this play out? You go for healing. You go for help. You go for relationship, right? You go to God for these things and the accuser stands up and says, you can't have that. You can't have that because I have a case for why this person is not worthy, God, of your power. I have a case against them. I have a case. Have you ever been in prayer and you're like, Lord, can there be a miracle in this place and it doesn't come to fruition and you're like, it must be because I am not worthy because the Satan accuses you day and night right? And, and stay with me. I'm going to get to the climax. Stay with me, right? And the problem is, is that the case is usually true. That's the problem. It's the case is true. That is, that is the problem. Well, I got, I got saved um, a few years back. I know, crazy, right? And um, I went to a prayer meeting and um, I was driving home from the prayer meeting on the first night of this prayer meeting up there on the bypass and I got pulled over. It was like 10.30 at night. I got pulled over by the police and the police officer comes up to me and he's like, oh, like, how you doing? I'm like, yeah, good, how are you going? He's like, yeah, I'm doing pretty well. And he's like, oh, do you realise that your licence is suspended? And I was like, sorry? He's like, do you realise that your licence is suspended? And I'm like, no, it's not. I think I've lost like one demerit in the last four years. Thank you very much. Right. And he's like, oh, okay, there must be a mistake. And he goes and checks his computer and he comes back and he says, no, there is a fine from 2009 that has not been paid and apparently, like, you have a suspended licence. And I said, this is absolutely insane. I do not have one. 
right? I've been able to renew my license every year. Um, and they would have said something, you know? And, and he's like, well, I'm so, I really don't know what to do. And I'm like, well, you can let me go. <laughs> that is what you can... And he's like, this is... I've never seen this because he's like... He said, usually when you renew your license, they'll serve it to you if you've got an issue with your license, right? And so he, this cop is like, I have no idea what's going on. And I'm like, that makes two of us. And he's like, I have to impound your car. I was like, sorry? And he's like, I have to impound your car. And I was like, hey, don't worry, it wasn't Jono. <laughs> uh, I have to impound your car. He's like, no, 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 no. And I was like, uh, uh, I don't know what's going on. And he's like, me neither. Drive it home. We'll sort it out. You know, I'll give you a call tomorrow. And I said, okay. And he goes, where were you coming from anyway? And I said, oh, a prayer meeting. And he's like, oh, gosh. And he, he just shook his head. He's like, I'm going to hell. And I'm like, that's not how it works. But anyway, I went through this court case for like 18 months. Like, yeah, 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 it was insane, right? I went through legal aid, legal aid, legal aid, legal aid, and they, they looked at the case and they're like, man, I, I can't understand the case. I'm on minimum wage and I don't want to deal with you. I'm like, okay. And it kept getting adjourned and adjourned and adjourned and adjourned. Every, I, I went through eight lawyers, right? Um, because I, I'm a stingy and I don't want to pay for one. And I'm sitting there building my own case and I got all the stuff from the Department of Transport and I'm like, can you, can you produce this fine? Like, can you, like, where is this fine, right? And the Department of Transport's like, well, it's been an administrative error. Obviously, you know, something's happened, whatever. And I'm like, okay, fine. And then, what happened? Um, and then I finally got a lawyer because I said, stuff this, I'm getting a lawyer. So I got a lawyer and this lawyer's like, yeah, We'll get you off, rah, rah, um, go to trial. So, because first it's pre-trial, then it's trial. Man, at, at some point, you spend that amount of time in the courtrooms, right? I just, like, there's a desk there for the legal aid people, and they leave at, like, 9 a.m., and I just set up my office there. Because you're there all day. And I just started working there when I had court on a Tuesday. And people come up to me, and they're like, hey, can you look at this case? And because I was the best dressed person in that courtroom, it's amazing people don't go to court in suits anymore. They go in flip flops and shorts. It's insane. And so I just had people coming up to me and saying, hey, can you look at this case? I'm like, sure, why not? And I just started looking at people's cases <laughs> and just giving them advice. And I just said, this is not legal advice. They're like, no worries, thank you for your time. Because they just thought I was a lawyer. And then, and then I, went, I ended up going to trial and my lawyer didn't turn up. And I rang him and I was like, hey, man, where are you? And he's like, man, I'm at the front of this house in this Breaking Bad situation, I can't be there. And I'm like, I don't even know what that means, but okay. So I sat down, and the judge looked at this case, and the magistrate is like, what is going on here? Why are you here? And I'm like, I don't know. Ask that person over there, the prosecuting officer. And the, and the judge said, I'm not dealing with this. You two go out and sort this out. Go talk about it, right? This is actually silly. Go talk about it and get it sorted. Anyway, we sit there, and I say to this lady, and I'm like, who's a very nice lady, if anyone knows her. Um, I have to watch my mouth. And then, like, you know, I'm like, I don't know what's going on. And she's like, okay, well, I'll go talk to the, to the police. She went and talked. She came back. She's like, look, they want me to prosecute you. I was like, I don't care what they want. I didn't do anything wrong. And so she went out for, like, five hours, came back, and we had another meeting. And, and I'm sitting there, and she's like, and, and, and I'm like, so what did you get? And she, gets, she pulls out all this paperwork from the Department of Transport. And she's like, well, apparently in 2009, someone reallocated a fine for them that was over to you and, and it did get processed and there's been an admin issue and you did have a suspended license at the time. And I said to her, so what you're telling me is that you don't actually have any evidence. And then she goes, I'm really getting annoyed with this case. I said, you and me both, I've been going through this for 18 months. And, she, and she's like, look, and she said to me, I've got enough here, right? I've got enough here to like triple and she just put the hard word on me. And I'm like, oh, okay, I'm scared. And she's like, she's, she's like, there's me and one other prosecuting officer in the Southwest. So just admit guilt, and then we'll give you an extraordinary license, and you'll be fine, you'll be able to drive, all good. Can we make that deal? I said, fine, let's make that deal. And I rang my lawyer after this, and the lawyer said, oh, that's the oldest trick in the book, you had her. Why didn't you know what to do? And I'm like, because I'm not a lawyer. And, he's, and my lawyer said, well... You're a sausage. And I said, excuse me? And he said, you're a sausage. I'm like, what do, you, what do you mean? He's like, you've been through the sausage factory, you've been processed, and now you're a sausage. <laughs> Call me when you have a real case and hung up. I then went into right, the, the, the court to get my extraordinary licence, right, stood up there, and, and I was like, this is the issue, ratty, ratty, rah. 
Um, you know, and it was a different prosecuting officer, the one that she told me about, the one that she said will give you one, and this prosecuting officer turns up, and the judge says, is there any objection from the prosecuting officer? And the prosecuting officer stands up, and the prosecutor, absolutely there is. And I'm like, sorry, what is going on here? Anyway, I went on a massive rant, let out all my adrenaline, and the judge gave it to me, and it was fine, but I realised I had a really bad lawyer and a really good accuser, Right? And if I'm standing there, if you're standing in the court, in the throne room, and you have got a prosecuting officer, an accuser, standing there accusing you of something, you better have a good lawyer. Amen? And you better have... That's the, that is the point of the story that I realised, is you better have a good lawyer if you're in court. And let me tell you about your lawyer, Jesus Christ the Righteous. Amen, is your lawyer. Jesus, yeah, that deserves a bit of praise, right? Jesus Christ, your lawyer. And you might be sitting there going, Matt, what does this have anything to do with standing firm? And I'll tell you, because I have another story, a very quick story. And I, this is a story that I've been told I have permission to share, and it is quite vulnerable, and it is about Emma, and we did pray about it, and she's following me sharing it. Uh, some years ago, she was in a relationship that did not end very well, and had to get to the point where there was a violence restraining order had to be taken out. And Emma had to show up to the court case for the violent restraining order, and she's sitting there before the court case, and, and she's crying, and she's trembling, and she's, she's scared because she has to go into this, this courtroom with this person who has caused her fear. And so she is sitting there and, and, and waiting for her case. You know when you're sitting there and you're waiting for your case to be, to be heard, and the other person's roaming around, and you're sitting there, and, and she was just sitting there and, and sitting there, and fear just came over her, and she just left. And, and, and the judge ruled it in his favour because she was not there. And, and she just could not go into a courtroom and face the accusations of this person. And so she just, she just left. She was just too afraid. And too often we sit there in the courtroom of God and we hear the accuser's case against us. And instead of standing firm and waiting for God's judgment, we leave the courtroom, and we stop asking. That's the, that's, the, that's the minimum thing that might happen is you will stop praying for a miracle because you are now under the belief that God is no longer a God of miracles. And the very worst case that will happen to you is you will find yourself back in the stronghold because that is what was familiar to you. If you find yourself being accused by the enemy, stand firm. Do not leave the courtroom. Do not leave the courtroom. The judge will hear your accuser's case, right? He will hear the lawyer's case, Jesus Christ the righteous, amen, the accuser's case, the lawyer's case, and the judge will say, is there any witnesses? Is there any witnesses? Well, let me tell you about your witness right, who comes out and testifies for you. The witness that comes out and testifies for you is the blood of Jesus. Amen. And the blood of Jesus comes out and says, I paint this person forgiven. Amen. The blood of Jesus will say, I paint this person free. Amen. I paint this person redeemed because I died for the person that is over there being accused by the enemy. Amen. And the blood of Jesus is what makes you a son or a daughter of the God most high. And the blood of Jesus will testify and say, this person's shame is gone. I poured out for it. Amen. The guilt this person feels right now I poured out for it. It is gone because I am the blood of Jesus and every drop was shed on the cross for you. Amen. Amen. And what the Satan is accusing you of has no standing anymore in court because the debt has been paid. 
The debt has been paid. The judge turns to you and says, one condition, do you call on Jesus Christ as your Lord and Saviour? And as it was prophesied in the Old Testament and as Paul testified in the New Testament, if you confess it with your mouth and believe it in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord and he rose from the grave, you will be saved. Amen? Amen. And once you repent, your case can now be heard for healing and for peace and for miracles and for relationships. Amen? Amen. But we must repent. We must repent. There's one tiny little thing I want to finish on. Because it's not enough to stand firm in the courtroom because the more times you find yourself in the courtroom being accused, the more you're going to find yourself worn down. And so my question is, and I can't not leave you with this, so if you've got an extra five minutes, is it okay if I go through it, is how do we stay out of the courtroom? Because I don't want to be in there being accused from Satan. I want to be out here achieving his mission. Amen? As a church, we must be humble and bold. This is, our, this is our one point for the day. We must be humble and bold. Humble enough to turn to Christ, bold enough to know he's our lawyer. Humble enough to turn to him and give him all the glory for everything and bold enough to realise that it is the Holy Spirit that works within us. You cannot do it alone. You are not Tom Cruise. This is not Mission Impossible. Amen? This is anti-Mission Impossible. This is Mission Possible and you need your team. You know, the most annoying thing about those movies is he leaves his team behind every time. And I'm not about it. I want a side story on the team, you know? The book of Joel talks about, um, the book of Joel talks about how God took everything away from them. They stripped them. Grain, wine, resources, gone. And then God decides to show them pity, right? And filled their vats, filled their grain, filled their land. They all rejoice. And then it says, and, then and. They had everything, then and. Everything, and it says, and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Oh man, wait till I do a sermon on prophecy and you're like, oh no, no. Your old men shall dream dreams and your young men shall see visions. Even on the male and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion, in Jerusalem, there shall be those who escape. As the Lord has said, and among the survivors shall be those whom the Lord calls. There is something powerful happening in this book, right? Thank you, Lord, for restoring. Thank you for repaying. But there's something more to life than having your vats full. Thank you for all that. But there's something more than that. And what God is going to do is he's going to pour out his spirit on everyone. And in the time that this was written, this was shocking. Because what God is saying is that the Holy Spirit is going to move from just the prophets to all of my people. In the Old Testament, you might not know this, the Holy Spirit only came on certain individuals and certain prophets to deliver God's message. And when the Holy Spirit descended on those people, something powerful happened. And now God is saying that that something powerful is going to land on all of my people. When the Holy Spirit comes upon us, we become witnesses for Christ And why is this important for standing firm or getting out of the courtroom? Because there is a spirit 
of the Antichrists operating in this world. And there is the Holy Spirit operating in this world. And there's two spirits operating in this world, right? The Antichrist spirit is coming and the Spirit of God is coming. And when Peter preaches in Acts, he quotes this very scripture. He quotes this very scripture and the Spirit descends on God's people in Acts 2 and the church of Jesus Christ was born on hostile ground. Right, on hostile ground. And it wasn't a big church, but it was humble and it was bold. Amen. Peter said, see their threats, enable your servants. See the hostile ground and Lord, enable your servants. And they prayed for boldness, but they knew it wasn't them. They had something greater. They had a power in them and that power was the Holy Spirit. Amen. And we submit to the Holy Spirit for change. When we pray, can I be filled with the Holy Spirit? What you're praying for is can the Holy Spirit take more control of me and may my flesh take a back seat? Amen. May I be led by the Holy Spirit today. When, when, when we sing that, when we, can you meet me here? It's not that he's not here. It's like in my flesh and in my hurt and in my rubbish. Lord, can you be here with me? Amen. Can you be here with me so I can be led by your Holy Spirit? What we have to realize is Satan is accusing the flesh. The Holy Spirit is good and perfect. He can't take the Holy Spirit to court. He can't take the Holy Spirit to court. And so as we deny more of our flesh and as we submit to more of the Holy Spirit, we spend less time in court because we know it's not us. We know we're being led by the Holy Spirit. Amen? Humility lets the Holy Spirit change us and boldness lets us be obedient. Humility lets the Holy Spirit change us and boldness helps us to be obedient. You need both if you're going to take ground for the kingdom. And what's good about taking ground for the kingdom is it's for God's glory and for your good. God's glory and your good. So when you pray for healing and relationship and hope and the accuser stands up to try and accuse you, you do what Jesus did and you take out the word of God and you say, I am not who you say I am. I am who my lawyer says I am because I have a relationship with him because I have called on him as my Lord and Saviour and his Holy Spirit operates within me and I submit to the Holy Spirit and I may stuff up and I may go back to my flesh but I know that my Lord and Saviour died for it and I repent from it every time and his blood testifies for me. Amen. And you tell the accuser to sit down by the authority of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Not in our authority, but in the authority of Jesus Christ. Amen. And you tell Satan, not today. Amen. Amen. When the accuser comes for you, you take the authority that Jesus died for and gave to you through the Holy Spirit who lives in you and you tell Satan to sit down. Amen. We operate out of a place of victory. Amen. Not out of a place of defeat. Because Jesus defeated Satan in the grave. Amen. And so you have the authority to take back what the enemy has stolen. Amen. Amen. You have that authority. You have that authority because you have a covenant. You've got a witness in the blood of Jesus and Satan no longer has a case against you. Amen. Everyone's sitting there like, it's sort of good news. It's kind of good news. I'm telling you, it's very good news. It is very good news that you are on the side of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And I'm going to finish with this picture. Because this picture 
is Bluff Knoll. I don't know if anyone's been there. And I said to Emma the other day, I want to climb Bluff Knoll. I want to climb Bluff Knoll. And so I did some research. It's the highest point in Western Australia, right? It's awesome. I'm pretty sure that's where Satan would have taken Jesus if he was in WA. And said, look at all the kingdoms, right? And I started researching and I got into this blogger and this person's like, yeah, but it takes about three hours return trip. Uh, my husband has like really long legs, so he found it really easy. The climb's not that bad, but I had to stop for breaks every now and then. Um, I was breathing quite heavily. And I was, I was a little bit disappointed because I'm like, man, I thought this was going to be a tough thing to do. I've heard it's a tough thing to do, right? And so I'm like, I'm going to do it at sunrise because if it's easy at 10 a.m., it's probably harder at 4 a.m. So I'll do it at 4 a.m., right? Because I'll see the sunrise. And then this person had like a photo of themselves standing at the top of Bluff Knoll at the end of the blog article. And I probably should have used that one instead of this one. But this person was like the fittest person I've ever seen in my life. And I'm like, if this person is complaining about being short of breath, I will die on the way up. You know what I mean? Like, how dare that person say, oh, I had to catch my breath a couple of times, right? And Joel said that the blood debt will be paid on Mount Zion. That's where the blood debt will be paid, on Mount Zion. And I want to show you Mount Zion. This is a Mount Zion. Very realistic representation, right? And what I want you to know is that Mount Zion is also Mount Moriah. It's the same mountain, same area. And Abraham took his son up there to give a sacrifice to God. And if you don't know the, the story, there was a ram instead of his son, and he replaced the son with the ram, and he called that place Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. And Mount Moriah is also the place that David went up, and David bought Arana's threshing floor from, from Arana to sacrifice for God. So he bought all of it on the top of Mount Moriah. And Mount Moriah, David was all in. Abraham was all in. Mount Moriah was also where Solomon built the temple on that threshing floor. And Solomon did not spare a expense to build this temple. He, he, just, he sacrificed everything he could to build that temple. Mount Zion is where Jesus died. Mount, sorry, Mount Zion is, is where Jerusalem was, right? What are we learning? The top of the mountain is not Kumbaya. The top of the mountain is not hugs and fairies and butterflies. I went on a great retreat. I really had a mountaintop experience. Really? Because mountaintops are not about Kumbayas. Mountaintops are about understanding that all worship requires sacrifice. Mountaintops are about understanding that all worship requires sacrifice. Jesus said to his followers, let's go up the mountain to Mount Zion, Mount Moriah, where the Temple Mount is. Let's walk up there. Let's go up. And when I get there, I'm going to be handed over. I'm going to be beaten. I'm going to be whipped. I'm going to be tortured. I'm going to be spat on. And the people who I came to save are going to put me on a cross and murder me. I'm going to be put in a tomb. And three days later, I'm going to rise from the dead and defeat Satan because in the same place that Abraham named Jehovah Jireh, God will provide, God will provide in this same place. And this time when God provides, I am going to provide everything. I am going to give over every drop of my blood at the top of Mount Zion because Jesus said to his disciple, guys, I am all in. I am all in. I am all in and, 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 and you have a choice. You have a choice today. Up the mountain that may be a little bit hard and treacherous 
or in the courtroom. That's the choice. Up the mountain or in the courtroom. The best way to avoid accusations is to hand over your life to the guidance of the Holy Spirit and pick up this thing, which is the Word of God, which has truth in it that will change your life. But it, it is when you, when you say, Lord, I'm all in, I'm all into this Christian thing, this, this, this Jesus thing, because you died for me on Mount Zion and you poured out all of your blood for me and you've given me the gift of the Holy Spirit and I'm going to be all in, then the, the climb up the mountain might be a little bit difficult because I've never done it before and I don't know how to climb mountains. I'm out of the stronghold and I'm trying to be faith-filled and I know I'm going to get knocked around and, and I'll, I just want to follow you and, and I'll commit right now to walking up the mountain and I know I'm going to get pushed back because I know it's difficult, because I know that all worship requires sacrifice, but mountaintops always provide deliverance. Mountaintops provide deliverance. And I want to say welcome to our church, welcome to the mountaintop, because Jesus was all in. We, as a people of God, are all in. Amen. And, and, and we will meet you where you are. We'll meet you where you are. Bottom of the mountain, away from the mountain, half of, we don't care. We'll meet you where you are. Come once a year, we will love you and we will shower on you and we'll give you grace and we'll give you mercy and we'll give you love because Jesus met people where they were. And as a church, we are all in and we want to have the humility to hand it over to be led, and we want to have the boldness to be obedient. Who are we? We are truth-seeking, spirit-led, faith-filled warriors of God. And the only reason we want to be that is to give God glory. Father God, we thank you for your word this morning. We, we thank you, Lord. And we just pray, Father God, that if there is anything in our heart right now, Lord, that is not of you, that is any sin, Father, from this week or from our life or anything that we have not chosen to repent from, Father, that you will make it clear right now that your Holy Spirit will convict us, will prod us, Father, and that we will right now, between us and you, Lord, will repent from that sin, Lord, and we will say sorry and we will ask for your forgiveness, Lord, and we'll ask for your filling of your Holy Spirit, Lord, so we can be more led by you and less led by our flesh. Father God, may we be humble to know it is all you and to give you all the glory and to help us to be bold, Father, for your name so that your name can be exalted high on our hearts and on our lives and in our region, Father, and in our families and in this church and in this country and on this world. May your name be lifted in lights. May your name get all the glory in this place today. Father, it is a humbling knowledge to know that we serve the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. And we ask for your Holy Spirit to reign in this place. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's stand, let's worship, let's eat, let's pray, let's prophesy. Go back to the beginning. Can't control what tomorrow will bring. But I know here in the middle, it's the place where you promise to be.